revive refuge in bodhicitta. And now very gently shift to analysis. And you gently remind yourself that within the 37 practices, we're within the great scope, the Mahayana great vehicle, explicitly developing bodhicitta, working towards Buddhahood enlightenment, these actual practices of a bodhisattva. And we'll think about some post-meditation practices, ways to think once we stand up, once we are into our normal daily life, ideas and attitudes to keep with us. And so we first think about things that we don't want, loss, even if others, in the grips of great desire, should steal or encourage others to take away all the wealth that I possess, to dedicate them entirely, my body, positions, and all my merits from the past, present, and future. This is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. And just sit with that verse the impression it makes on your mind, the wisdom that it awakens. And we don't want suffering, however we can use it on the path. Even if others should seek to cut off my head, though I've done them not the slightest wrong, to take upon myself out of compassion all the harms they have amassed, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. allowing that verse to resonate, to somehow touch our heart. And we don't want disgrace or a bad reputation or people to think poorly of us, but this can also be taken on the path. Even if others should declare before the world all manner of unpleasant things about me, being only of their qualities in return with a mind that's filled with love, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. Connecting with that.
And not only do we not want to be thought ba badly of, we also don't want to be spoken badly of. However, these can be used on the path to awakening. Even if others should expose my hidden faults or deride me when speaking amidst great gatherings of many people, to conceive of them as spiritual friends and to bow before them in respect, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. Even if others whom I've cared for like children of my own should turn upon me and treat me as an enemy, to regard them only with special fondness and affection, as a mother would her ailing child, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. Just thinking about using what is difficult to bear. For example, being wronged in return for kindness. Even if others, equal or inferior to me in status, should, out of arrogance, disparage me, to honor them as I would my teacher, by bowing down my head before them, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. Thinking about the way humiliation is also difficult to bear and can also be used on the path. And we can even use deprivation. Even though I may be destitute and despised by all, beset with terrible illness and plagued by evil spirits, still to take upon myself all beings' ills and harmful actions without ever losing heart, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas.
we can use deprivation, but we can also use prosperity. Even though I may be famous and revered by all, and as rich as Vasha Varana, the god of wealth himself, to see the futility of all the glory and riches of this world, and to remain without conceit, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. And then we go even deeper, using hatred. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to subdue the mind with the forces of loving kindness and compassion. For unless the real adversary, my own anger, is defeated, outer enemies, though I may conquer them, will continue to appear. and using desire. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to turn away immediately from those things which bring desire and attachment, for the pleasures of the senses are just like salty water. The more we taste of them, the more our thirst increases. And so as you consider all of those post-meditation practices while you're in meditation right now, just try and feel your way into some of the main points that struck you, things you want to keep in the forefront of your mind as you live your life and repeat them to yourself. And conclude to yourself, whatever happens, happiness or suffering, what I want or what I don't want, may I use all of this on the path to transformation and awakening for the benefit of myself and all sentient beings. And dedicate for full awakening complete enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings.
so you can relax your attention. So that was just kind of a, a classic, just reflective meditation, something you could do on your own with the text in front of you, read a verse, close your eyes, just see how it's landing so far, read a verse, see how it's landing so far. And then at the end, really um, either write down for yourself or repeat to yourself what really struck a chord, what really made sense or like had that ring of truth of something that you maybe in a way already knew, but had forgotten or wasn't consistently present enough. So you don't kind of lose the little aha moments you have during a reflection. So whether you journal them or you just repeat them in your head, but trying to keep those little glimmers of wisdom as they flicker up, um, that's a, a good way to do reflection. So in Buddhism, we talk a lot about um, wisdom is developed through hearing, contemplating and meditating, right? And so we do a lot of the hearing, which is like going to class and studying and reading, but um, we don't do so much of the reflection step and then we jump straight into meditation. And this reflection step is like the bridge where you find the teachings that you've come across and you marry them with your own logic and your own life experience so that when you meditate on them, they have a deeper chance of integrating and actually changing your behaviors and mindsets. So this reflection stage, it could be in the form of, you know, you've seen Tibetan monks and nuns do that formal debate process, but it also can just be a group discussion. It can be a journal exercise with yourself or a slow read rather than a, a quick read of something where you're like, oh yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. You actually go into, oh right, what does that mean for me specifically, personally as an individual? Yeah, and you really try and like find a way to come home to these verses. And then when you do like a formal meditation, maybe just on one verse, it actually starts to clear obstacles and bring merit and integrate in a much deeper way. So anyway, um, do you have questions about um, that process? There's some of those verses which may or may or may not have connected with you. Some of them might have been too radical. Some of them might have been not radical enough. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for being here. I'm glad yeah, that sure. you're teaching. And I'm sorry, I was really late yesterday. So I apologize, maybe you discussed this already. Um, but I'm just curious, because when I was reading the verses last night, um, it really struck me how similar they are in, to the eight, eight verses of mind transformation. And I was just curious if there was some connection between those two um, teachings. Yeah, yeah, there definitely is. Um, they're all in the, the teachings of the great Kadampa masters or the Lojong tradition, the thought transformation mind training tradition. So it's the same category of Buddhist literature. So the classics, Eight Verses of Thought Transformation by Geshe Lungri Tampa, short and pithy and incredibly powerful. It's an amazing text to study. Um, 37 Practices of a Bodhisattva has more preliminary stuff to kind of like remind you of preliminaries and the small scope and the medium scope before it jumps into the great scope. So it kind of has a longer warm up. And then it has a little bit more specifics. So um, they all are pointing towards like Tonglen practice, the practice of giving and taking. Um, they're all pointing towards equalizing and exchanging self for others and developing bodhicitta. Um, this text has more about the six perfections specifically, which we're going to do more today. Um, but yeah, they're absolutely related um, and, uh, and well spotted. Yeah, you could hear a lot of the same themes running through, which is basically you can use everything if you think about it right. However, you know, you don't want to go into this force feeding attitude where you think just because I understand it logically and I see how it could work were I to do it, that that's as good as having done it or I force myself into it before I'm ready to, you know, I understand intellectually and so then I must be there emotionally and we're not yet. So in these kind of reflective exercises, you're almost picturing yourself as if you can already do this while still knowing you don't all the time because kind of picturing it pulls you closer to it. You know, it's, it's not the same as Tantra taking the result as the path, but it's got a similar philosophy and kind of psychology under it, which is if you can picture, 
a more evolved version of where your mind is, it kind of pulls you into it more swiftly. You know, and and also it kind of shows you where you're actually at, you know, so when you find little pockets of resistance where you think, oh, that verse is lovely. Yep. That verse is lovely. Yep. Oh, wow. That verse. Wow. Okay. That's a bit much really, you know, that, that kind of gives you a, a, okay, more to dig into there. And that's such a useful self-knowing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I yeah, really sure. appreciated last night um, or yesterday when you pointed out just to be easy on yourself, because I, I can get really wound up with these um, verses feeling like a, I can't get there, and B, I'm never going to get there, at least not in this time. So it's really helpful to know that, you know, you can start small and just visualize that. And yeah, and, and treat so it aspirational. Helpful. Yeah, it's, it's aspirational. It's not like, here's what you should be, and if you're not, you're bad. And here's what you should be, and if you're not, you're bad. In another way, you're bad. You know, it's not at all. It's more like, guess what you'll be able to do when you're a bodhisattva, mm -hmm. you know? And you're like, oh my gosh, when I'm a bodhisattva, nothing is going to get to me. When I'm a bodhisattva, nothing will disturb my peace and I will have an open heart towards everyone and I'm not going to have that heart shut down, alienated, superstitious feeling. I'm not going to have that craving of, oh, I need you to be here or, oh, get away. You know, I'm just not going to have that push and pull so immediate and consistent in my life. It's going to be amazing to be a bodhisattva. I'm so looking forward to it, <laughs> you know, rather than here's all the ways I've fallen short. It's more like here's all the ways I'm going up you know yeah, yeah. but it's you. so easy to read it the wrong way because that's kind of how we were taught to read things like this is uh, here's a list of things you should already know how to do and we're like mm -hmm. 